Now, uh, and so when I went in, in June of 52, the funny thing about it is I never even thought much about the war. Right. You know, the fact that, the truth is, the fact that they were fighting in Korea really didn't um, dawn on me and said, hey, man, you might get killed, you know. That part didn't enter my mind, but I did have a, uh, a, uh, a, 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 I guess you call it a, a, a crazy thought. I don't know. I say, well, maybe I, when I got get on orders to go to Korea, maybe I can find my brother. I, I had that thought, but I never thought about harm coming to me. And so I got to Korea myself in December of 52. And he was missing in action when I got there, you see. Were you sent to the same places? Hmm? You, were you in the same places he was? I was a different unit from what he was in. When I got to Korea, my unit was totally integrated, but not his. Because he got there two years before. Tell me your unit that you were with in uh, Korea that you... Company C. 32nd Infantry Regiment, 7th Infantry Division. So even when you started um, your basic training, your group was integrated in the United States? For basic training, yes. My Up there at Fort Jackson, yes. In South Carolina? Yeah. Did you happen to know that Fort Jackson was one of the few places that was um, integrated training? Mm -mm. No, I didn't know that, but I know I, when I got there in June of 52, my unit and all the units there, that, that's all Fort Jackson did was train troops, and all the units there were integrated for training. Could your family visit you when you were at Fort Jackson? No, no, not like today. We didn't even, when you, when you got out of basic training, they didn't even have ceremonies for you today, you know. They do today. No, you just graduated from basic training, got your orders, and moved on. Immediately, your orders were to go to Korea. Yeah, I had to go. I had to go for, through Fort Benning for some more training first. But I already had the orders leaving Jackson with Fort Benning for light weapons training, and then on to Korea. Um, also at Fort Benning, there's Officer Candidate School. Did anyone yeah. recommend mm -hmm. you for that? Or? No, 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 no. <clears throat> was that something you wanted to do? Did you feel... Maggie, Maggie, mm -hmm. to be very honest, I knew nothing about that. I mean, I, 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 I was so young. I was just 17 and a half. I knew nothing about the Army. I, you know, I, I knew nothing. I was just, uh, I was just a, a shave tail, just a... I knew nothing, you know, I'm doing as I was told. I was going on to school through the light weapons course and then on to Korea. So even then, you don't know the story of the Buffalo soldiers or the sort of pride and um, At that history? point, no. <clears throat> no. I didn't begin to dig into Buffalo soldiers until a year later when I went out to Fort Huachuca. No. Fort Huachuca. In, Later. In Arizona. Yes. Can you tell me you're in Korea, um, and at some point you decide you're going to make a career out of the military? I got back, well, while I was, let me back up. This might be interesting. You'll find a lot of what you were just asking in that book, too. It'll help you. But do, when I remember Korea coming out of South Carolina, Growing up in Charleston, I had never seen snow. I had never seen a mountain. And Korea had plenty of both. My God, Meg, I'd never been in a place so cold. I mean, flat cold, and I got there on 17th of December, 11 days before I turned 18. Now, when the war ended, in July of 53, my unit and all of our units, United Nations units, 
my division and my regiment pulled back off the front lines to a place called Nair Wijong Bu. And we pitched tents and stuff, and we established with tents a place called Camp Casey. That still stands today, but it's all buildings in Korea today. But I'm happy to say my unit and I were there to help establish that. It's all brand new buildings there today, but we established it with tents. Okay, so we would get the Stars and Stripes, which was a military newspaper. And we would get them about three, four, five days after publication. I looked at the headline one day and it says, now that the truce is over, prisoners of war were going to be exchanged. Okay, remember now I'm just a private. So, they were, the Marines were in an area was called the uh, Moon Sun Ni, which was not far from Pan Moon Jump on the coast of Korea, and that was in the Marines area. And they were building a big stockade to house these prisoners of war, the Chinese, and our returning prisoners. So I I said, maybe my brother will be coming back. So I went to my platoon sergeant and told him uh, that I would like to be up at there when they start bringing these prisoners back. I wanted to look for my brother. And he says, OK, I'll arrange where you can talk to the company commander, which was a captain. So he took me in to see the company commander. The first thing the company commander asked me when I told him my brother was a POW, he said, what are you doing in Korea? I knew nothing about that. Uh, I think what he was getting at is uh, there was supposed to be something about a soul surviving son or something like that. But I knew nothing about regulations. Nothing. Absolutely nothing. I said, what do you mean? What am I doing in Korea? The Army sent me here. So he went up to headquarters and they cut orders attaching me to the Marines. And so I help, I work with them building that stockade just so I can be covered up there for those, for the time. And then when all the prisoners were exchanged, I knew that my brother had made it. I knew that before the family did. Okay. You had seen everybody who was a prisoner who was come still through, alive. Yeah, come through, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I think you, You'll find it very interesting, because I, I checked a lot of records out on that. And so then uh, after that, the truce was signed. You know, the truce was already signed, so we, we thought we were going to come home and didn't get, to get out of Korea until April of 54, so I came home, went back, was reassigned to Gordon, and then I got out of the Army in 55, came home. You went to Fort Gordon in after Korea in uh, Augusta, Georgia, mm -hmm. or in Florida? Augusta. Augusta. Yeah. What were you doing there? What was I doing there? This time they sent me to a signal unit. What was your responsibility in the? Signal? They had me climbing poles to string communication wires like the wire, like the old. Why well, here I was an infantryman, and have now I found myself climbing telephone poles. The string communication wires for telephones. But you're back in the States, and and so do you think, I want to make a career out of this military? Or? Mm -hmm. no. no, no, no. At that time, I was hell-bent on getting out. But And so I got discharged from uh, Fort Gordon, and uh, I think it was June of 55, and I came home. And you knew something about the GI Bill? Did yes. you uh, uh, use the GI Bill? Not yet. Okay. Not yet. And so what did you do? You came back home to Charleston. Yes. What did you do at that time? I got a job. Went, went to work at Edwards 5, 10, and $1 department store. I worked there for a while, but it wasn't for, wasn't for me. So I decided to go back to the military. Did they open arms, greet you? Oh, yeah. 
but no problem. I didn't go, but I stayed out 22 months. It was a full 22 months. But that brings me to the story this is going to interest you. While I was out working at Edwards, Edwards at that department store, I knew. Remember now, I got out of the Army at 20. But I had enough sense to know that that job at Edwards was a dead-end job. I knew that. Nowhere for me to go. And I wanted a better job. So I do remember sometime in 1949 when they recruited the first black, six black policemen on the Charleston Police Department. The first six. One of those policemen was a friend of our family. Okay, he'd come by the house all the time. So I would talk to him about working at Edward and how frustrated I was. And I wanted something, a better job, with good benefits. And he says, you know what? He says, why don't you go downtown and see old man Stoney, Mr. Stoney, and tell him you want to be a policeman? Now, I'm going to let me tell you who Stoney was. First, let me tell you this before I get There are two families of Stoney's in Charleston and Jones Island, one black, one white. Facts. Okay? My mother had told me long before when I was born, I was delivered by a white doctor by the name of Dr. Banov, B A N O V. And since we had the surname Stoney, the mayor of Charleston at that time was Thomas P. Stoney. Interesting. So, Dr. Banner, according to what my mom told me, told him, why don't you name him like the mayor? And she did that. Okay. Now, I had never met this man. But by the time I had come out of high school and out of the army, he was no longer the mayor, he, but he was a big lawyer in Charleston and had his fingerprints, footprints all over politics. And so this is what our, my, uh, the family friend that was on the police force with him, he can help you. But Growing up, being honest, you know, I was scared to go down and see the guy. He said, go down, he can help you. I was scared, you know, we, we, weren't, we were never taught to dislike white people, but we were taught to stay away from them. We were, we were taught to stay away from them because they can hurt you. So I was scared. I didn't want to go down there. But he stayed after me. So one day, I got enough nerve. I walked all the way down from 201 Company Street to Broad Street to his office. 51 Broad Street was his office, where his office was located. The former mayor of Charleston. And the shingles, Thomas P. Stoney, attorney at law up there on 51 Broad Street. I think the grandson is still in that office. And I went in there, Maggie. I mean, I was shaking like a leaf inside. And the receptionist asked me, she says, what can I do for you? I, I told her I wanted to see Mr. Stoney. And she was up front, and his office, the door was open, you know, in the back. But you could see the door. The door was open, and he was back there. And she. She, <laughs> uh, she says, who shall I say is called? And I told her my name, and she looked like that, you know. So she recovered real fast and went on and told him. And I heard a gruff voice that said, hey, man. And I went in, he said, sit down. And I saw for the first time, I knew of him, but I had never met him. 
I saw a little short man, hair as white as that, sitting behind the desk. And after he told me to sit down, you know what he said to me? This is quote. He says, so you the boy with my name? The boy. I caught that, but I didn't flinch. I didn't like it, but I didn't flinch, you know. But that's exactly what he said. You the boy with my name? I'm there for, you know, I, I've, got, I've got to be courteous. I, I'm here seeking his help. And I said, I said, yes, sir. He said, well, let me tell you something. Every time I go to a country club, I would get teased about you. And so I asked him, I said, how do you know that I even existed? And here's what he said. He said, I heard your name on the radio playing football. They would tape our games and rebroadcast it. That's how he found out that there was a black kid in Charleston with his name, and he would be teased about it. That's exactly what happened. Were you ever teased about being the, the mayor's son? <laughs> uh, some of the older people would, would tell me that, but they never did tease me. No. Some of the older blacks, older people, did he help you get a job? I want to tell you what he did. He, while we talked, I, I asked me what could he do for me. And I told him I wanted to be a police. But to be honest, I was, I, I, he said, why do you want to be a policeman? And I told him how well, I believe in law and all, you know, the whole, you know, whole nine yard. And he said, then he asked me, are you registered to vote? And I told him, no. And he said, well, you need to register as a Democrat. Okay? And then he did something strange. He picked up the phone while I was sitting there, picked up the phone, called the chief of police. The chief of police at that time name was Kelly. And this is what he said, quote, Chief, I got a boy in my office. His name is Thomas P. Stone. And this is a quote. He's a Negro. He didn't say nigger. He said Negro, N-E-G-R-A. I caught that too. He made it clear of who I was. Okay. He wants to be a policeman, and I'm endorsing his application. He said it right there. And so I'm sending him down there right now. So he told me when, when I left his office, he told me to do th two things. You go down to the police station, you see Chief Kelly, Kelly, then you register as a Democrat. And when I walked out of that office, Maggie, and the chief was waiting for me. And I walked from Broad Street straight, the police station was on St. Philip Street then. I walked straight there and the police chief was waiting. He gave me all those applications. I took him home, started filling them out, and every day this cop, that's the friend of the family, he was keeping his ears open down there, and, and you know, nothing happened. Nothing happened, and I was getting uh, a little uh, despondent about reading, and he, he would stop by the house, come on, man, the next cop they hire is you. I'm telling you, he said, old man Stoney got his hand and everything. I'm telling you, it's going to be you, and it didn't happen. So I said, I waited about, let me see, this was the fall of, the fall, went to 56, and then March of 57, I said, hey, but I went back to the Army and stayed. And I said to myself, if I go back, I'm going to make a career. Do you know if, if they hired someone? In well, the now, the after I was in Huachuca for about two months, here, here, my mom called, I called home, and mom said, all oh, bunch of papers from the police department came for you. And she sent it all for me, but it just took too long for me. But I look back at that, I don't regret it. No, I don't think I would have made a good police policeman.
you go into the service again, mm -hmm. you've got, uh, you don't have to do basic training or no. anything. They take you in and say, what are they going to do with you this time? Well, when I went back to the military, I, I, my MOS, that's your military occupational specialty, I was an infantryman, light weapons infantryman, even though they had me climbing poles and in Fort Gordon, I was a light weapons infantryman. And that's where they intended to send me back without any more basic training. And I said, hey, wait a minute. By this time, I had learned a few things about the military. And I said, look, man, check my scores. I ought to be able to go to school or something, some kind of school other than infantry to look at school. So I went into electronic communication from that point and went to school for electronic communication. And that, and the, for the rest of my career in the military, that's what I was working. I worked in uh, Tropo Ferry Scattered Communication, uh, uh, VHF, which is very high frequencies in communication, and including satellite before I got out. And you're engaged in, you're in the United States at this point, or they're starting to send you around after your training to other places. What are you using the communication skills for? What when I first retired, when I first retired after my total years in service were 23, were 23 years and maybe four months. Okay, and I retired as a first sergeant. But when I went back in in 57, I started all over as a private. I wasn't much more than that when I got out anyhow in 55. So I I uh, I got I retired from the army in '76 as a first sergeant. Then I got a job on Fort Machuca, working for uh, let's see what was the name at the time, the uh, Communication Engineering Installation Agency. They went all around the world installing communication uh, systems and network, and that was in my field from the military. Okay, so. That's where I worked. And then I uh, started going to University of Arizona South at night. Well, let me take you back out um, to the world when you're going in in um, 57 again. So you're not going to go to Korea, pretty sure. Do you think you're going to be sent around after your uh, training, electronics training? Do you think you're going to be sent to other places around the world? What's your, where do you go? Where did I go? Okay, arrived at Fort Huachuca in 1957, was assigned to the 16th Signal Battalion. This is a communication outfit. In 19, the same battalion, I stayed in that house for a very long time. In 1961, when the Berlin crisis uh, occurred in Germany, my battalion, the 16th Signal Battalion, packed up and we went to Germany. We settled in Bootsbach. B U T Z B A C H, Bootsbach, Germany. Okay, families couldn't go. We thought we were we thought we were going to war against the Soviets. Did three years there, and I came back to the states in '64, and back to Fort Huachuca, right back to Fort Huachuca. This time, I was assigned to the 459th Signal Battalion, and two years later, we found this. I was out this whole battalion going to Vietnam in 66. Take me to Germany when you're there um, uh, in 64. Uh, so your family can't go with you. 61 we went. 61 uh, you went. From 61 to 64. They couldn't go immediately because everybody thought we were going to go to war against the Soviets. What is Germany like at this time and what are your thoughts about being in the land, um, the country where World War II was so um, evident. It was interesting to me because I love history, okay? I loved Germany, but our troops, our American troops, took their prejudice with them to Germany. So as a result, the gas houses where the troops were stationed, okay, the different places where the troops were stationed, were very much segregated because of the troops. Oh, 
Okay. So were the housing. In 61, it's segregated. Yeah. By choice? Yeah. I, I don't know. I, I, I said our troops took their prejudices with them. They took it to Korea, too. Took it to, to Germany, too. And this is why the military cracked up, down on it in the early 70s. So as a result, some gas house, some gas house, if you go into, go, you, you go into, you may get in a fight, okay, against other GIs, not the Germans. So, and there were some Germans that wouldn't rent to you, not all of them. Okay. But still, we love Germany because I know, I knew that every step I took, I was walking on history, every step. And so I would go to, to the library and I would uh, pick up books about German history, particularly what happened in World War II, because I had already read what our generals said about World War II, and I wanted to know what 